war in Ukraine is like no other war I've covered before. I think the scale of the violence and the scale of a state-on-state -state conflict sets Ukraine apart. I got into journalism in order to be a war reporter because I think it's, from a journalistic point of view, without a risk of sounding self-important, it's one of the purest and most important forms of our profession. On the first day of the war, Russia launched a series of missile strikes right across Ukraine. That morning, I woke up in Severodonetsk. I don't mind admitting I felt scared, I felt concerned. And that initial wave of panic did pass, but nonetheless, there was this lingering background level of anxiety because none of us really knew what was going to happen. In the first wave of the assault, we saw an attempt to take the capital, Kyiv. It failed for a number of reasons, but perhaps one of the most significant was that the Russians had lost the element of surprise. The Russian troops who were given the mission to attack Hostomel airfield were given their orders about three days before the invasion. And we now understand they started boasting, they were so excited, they started discussing this mission on unencrypted lines. So what that meant is that when those forces arrived, they were met by significant force. There was a Ukrainian force lying in wait for that attack. Now, the reason the Russians needed Hostomel airfield was because they wanted to create an airhead. They wanted to take an airfield at which they could then fly in a lot of their heavy armor, their heavy guns, their armored personnel carriers, even fly in tanks. Now, because that failed, that's why we saw those scenes of that 40 kilometer long convoy getting bogged down in the mud. And as that convoy got bogged down, it became easier and easier for the Ukrainians to harass it with guerrilla style tactics, small unit tactics going in and generally degrading Russian forces, degrading Russian morale. Now, they'd also failed simultaneously in their attempts to assassinate President Zelensky and attempts to take out Ukraine's top leadership. In those first days, we saw the assault from the southeast towards Mariupol. That was from Russian soil, from the direction of, sort of Rostov on Don. Troops burst out of Crimea and they moved northwest towards Kherson. Now, this is quite interesting. They seize Kherson very quickly and without an awful lot of resistance. Not with no resistance, but without an awful lot of resistance. So there's some suggestions, there's a wide held belief now in Ukraine that perhaps they were assisted on that assault by traitors, by insiders. Perhaps people failed to destroy bridges, which could have slowed their advance. There's a sense that the Russians knew their way through minefields, and the only way they could have done that is if they'd had access to secret maps about where those minefields were located. The result of which was a few days into the conflict, they had seized most of Kherson province, including Kherson city, which was on the west bank of the Dnipro River. Now, that was the only territory in those first days of the war. In fact, the only territory up to this point that Russia has seized on the west bank of the Dnipro River. That then allowed them to attack a place called Mykolaiv, another major city in the south, a major naval port. This was the Battle of the Bug, it was the battle for Mykolaiv. Now, if that city had fallen, there would have been no natural obstacles between Russian forces and Odessa, the dual port city of Odessa. So we saw the failure in the north in Kyiv. We saw the assault on Mariupol, which of course was bogged down and that assault went much slower than they wanted. And then we saw, from a Russian point of view, a relatively successful assault through Kherson, but then they were held up at Mykolaiv. In terms of the first time I encountered the violence, on the 25th of February, we drove up to Kharkiv and we drove to the northern edge of the city. At the junction of the ring road, we found a Ukrainian unit. And while we were there, while we were chatting to them, suddenly they all started diving for cover. We could hear the distant explosions of artillery guns, and then we could hear the much closer explosions of those rounds uh, hitting home, hitting Kharkiv. And that was terrifying. <laughs> It really brought home that, that feeling I'd had the day before of being on the wrong end of a Russian invasion. I remember standing on the platform and the carriages inside were filling up with mums and their young children and the people left on the platform were the dads and the brothers and the sons. And I remember watching a father with his finger drawing a, a heart on the mist on the outside, the train window. and. Uh, his wife tracing that heart with her finger on the inside. And it was just 
an incredibly poignant and really human heartbreaking moment where you saw what was happening to families being wrenched apart and not necessarily knowing when they were ever going to see each other again. The other thing that's been particularly hard has been meeting the, the civilian victims uh, in, in hospitals. Um, people are, you know, being cut down by sliced open, maimed, killed by flying shards of hot metal from rockets and artillery shells. And it's vile, you know, when you see what that does to people. So the first time I saw a dead Russian soldier was in a little hamlet called Malarahan, just to the northeast of Kharkiv, Ukraine's second city. And we then went to visit this position after the Russians had been defeated. You know, the devastation to me felt like a scene out of World War One. In a couple of the bunkers, uh, there were the remains of Russian soldiers. And, and of course, we know that people are, are killed in war. And we saw the pictures of wounded civilians, particularly in those first few, week, few weeks. But nonetheless, it's quite shocking to see uh, the remains of a uniformed Russian soldier. It reminds us, ultimately, of, of what is happening and of what's at stake. I've only met two Russian soldiers who've taken part in this conflict who were still alive, and those were uh, prisoners of war in a prisoner of war camp in central Ukraine. It's very difficult to interview prisoners of war, and we were very mindful to try and do this in a way that did not breach our commitment, well, did not breach the Geneva Conventions, and so we were very careful to keep them anonymous. And we could only interview them in the presence of uh, their captors, their Ukrainian captors. But nonetheless, the stories that they told us were of an army that was ill-equipped and demoralized and poorly led. And indeed, I remember one of them, one of the soldiers described his commanding officers as jackals. After about 100 days of the conflict, I went to a place called Lysychansk. We met a couple of families who'd come out of their block of flats, partly destroyed. They were cooking on a wood fire. And just about 30, 40 yards away from where they were cooking their supper, they'd buried one of their neighbors who'd been killed in a strike a few days earlier. And yet still, they didn't want to leave. They could have done. There were humanitarian organizations, volunteers were driving in along similar routes that we'd used to offer these people an opportunity to flee. But there was a sense that perhaps these people who were staying were possibly the people who do support Russia, who were perhaps waiting for the Russian invasion to take the city. And, and that was quite a salutary lesson. So we met a Ukrainian tank crew when most of Kherson was still very much under Russian control. And at one point we got within a few hundred meters of the closest Russian soldiers. We were effectively in a trench network with the Ukrainians. We were uh, told to be in a certain place at a certain time and uh, we heard this sort of growl of a uh, Ukrainian tank. Now that Ukrainian tank had been hidden, and I won't explain where it was hidden for obvious reasons, um, but it emerged. The Ukrainian tank commander, um, after a couple of shells, I think it was after two, came out of his turret and tried to, and signaled us that actually um, they were getting shot at and that we should scarper, uh, which is what we did, because uh, we we were driving in a soft skin pickup, which didn't give us any protection. But we met up with him later, and he explained that they carried on and fired about seven or eight rounds, and they'd only left when one of the Russian shells had landed a few meters away from their tank. At the beginning of the summer, the conflict had entered a kind of artillery slogging match where both sides were relying on their artillery to try and blast the other side uh, into submission now. And then we saw two things. We saw a stunning Ukrainian counterattack east of the city of Kharkiv. Now, most of that summer, Ukraine had been talking about Kherson in the south, saying that that was where their attack was going to come. And that messaging had actually encouraged the Russians to, re to reinforce Kherson. They'd taken troops from around Kharkiv and moved them south. The Ukrainians launched an attack in Kharkiv, and I think their success took them by surprise as well. The Russian lines collapsed, and suddenly they were advancing not just into the eastern Kharkiv province, but they're making it back into Lugansk, into the Donbass, taking towns which had fallen in the first few hours of the conflict. That was a huge morale boost. That was then followed by the attack on Kherson. The HIMARS rockets allowed the Ukrainians to target supply dumps, ammunition dumps behind the front lines and made it impossible for the Russians to resupply their troops. The commander, the Russian commander, made the decision to pull them back rather than risk losing them. 
So soon after Kherson fell, we managed to get in and we managed to link up with a Ukrainian police special forces unit who were one of a number of teams that were making their way through the city. We're looking for either some stray Russians, they haven't made it out, or for the remnants of their being here. We're making sure nothing is mined. We're making sure the territory is safe. So basically we're sweeping through to make sure there's no leftovers. We went to the airport just outside the city and that was absolutely devastated. The terminal building, uh, which once welcomed Ryanair flights, had been absolutely uh, obliterated. And around it and in front of it was a very elaborate uh, and, and sort of well-built system of Russian trenches. So now that airfield we know had been absolutely hammered by Ukrainian long-range artillery. But the city itself, just behind it, largely unscathed. Now that's largely because of this Ukrainian tactic of hitting the supply lines behind the city, which had forced the Russians to retreat. But they hadn't simply retreated. They had left an absolutely deadly legacy of booby traps. The bomb squads were going room to room, checking for grenades. They'd found tank mines, wired to hand grenades, wired to doors. Uh, they'd found medical kits. Uh, placed on top of sort of spring-loaded mines, you know, almost anything you can imagine, uh, but a number of sort of crude, jerry-rigged explosive devices designed to try and kill and maim the people who came back into uh, these buildings. The other consequence, I should say, of the Russian retreat was that they ramped up their artillery attack. So the Russians had fallen back to the left bank of the Dnipro River, and they were now shelling the city in Ukrainian control. That has continued and that has increased uh, it increased in the two weeks that we were there. We were living there without any electricity, without any running water, as was everybody in this city. It was incredibly rudimentary, very little phone signal, very hard and basic living, but nonetheless uh, a sort of determination to be there to, to sort of, and, and a relief among the people we met, a relief and joy that the Ukrainians had come in. But that was tinged with fear over what the future would hold, and that fear was justified by the increase uh, in, in shelling. The fact that Ukraine has managed to stall and reverse a Russian invasion is, is nothing short of miraculous, but that miracle has been made possible because of their fighting spirit, their adaptability, and increasingly as well through the support of their allies, both in terms of high-tech Western weaponry and increasingly through uh, the sustenance of ammunition supplies and the training uh, of soldiers. But as that war drags on, two things I think risk coming to the fore. One is, is that the unity we've seen among Ukraine's allies, particularly among NATO, Europe and America, will come under increasing strain. It's, it's hard to maintain that kind of cohesion over the long term. And I think Russia is probably banking on the Western solidarity wearing thin. The other uh, reason that a long war suits Russia is that Russia can mobilize more people. It's a bigger country. It can draw on a bigger reserve of fighting age people to throw into the front. Russia isn't doing anything particularly sophisticated. We've heard it's resorting to World War I tactics, sending wave after wave of people over the front to grind down Ukraine's defenses. But if it does that enough, uh, if it can't be stopped, then there is always a risk that those, those defenses will be uh, worn down. You know, the war is likely to drag on for at least uh, another year. But as it goes beyond that, we must be conscious that victory is not guaranteed and Ukraine will need to fight very, very hard, to continue to fight very, very hard. And it will continue to need support and the West united support.